Well, it doesn't take all that much courage to dissent in a place like Australia. And uh, the example you brought up of the so-called dissent in my last report uh, is, I hope, a happy one because uh, it succeeded and they reversed that policy. I don't flatter myself because of my dissent or my dissent alone, but saying what you think, expressing your opinion about the merits of your country's laws, about the merits of international law, and about how either of those should be changed, that really is the area in which one person dissents and another person delivers the government line. It's to be recalled in most countries on earth, mm. uh, there is a government and something called an opposition. Uh, and this year's dissenter may be next year's lawmaker. And so dissent is really only expressing your opinion where you are confident from what you know or from what you expect that other people will disagree with you and perhaps hold a, an opposite view. Uh, it is of the essence of democratic, principled and scholarly uh, consideration of laws that there will be those who think they are fine as they are, those who think they are an abomination and those who think they should be improved. Uh, that will never lead to just one voice with one opinion. And within the context of the, um, of the of surveillance, metadata and security, within the organisation itself, it's been said in the literature that independent monitoring will not necessarily be successful if there's not that healthy dissent within. Almost one that we'd never get to look at, to view. Yes. How do we encourage that level of professionalism where it is seen as, and I'm drawing from the literature here, where that internal dissent that is away from the eye of the public is encouraged. Well, it does help to bring in people uh, like David Anderson in the United Kingdom and me here, uh, whose careers do not depend upon uh, favour from government mm -hmm. um, and who are professionally and culturally inclined to say what we think, uh, uh, even when that is uh, unpopular or confronting for some of your audience. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's very important, as you say, functionally to define the role as one where you are not merely welcome to, but positively expected to canvas, consider and assess contrary views to those which promoted the laws in question or which are manifest in the laws in question. So a testing, an auditing, a scrutiny, all of those are ideas which positively involve considering hypotheses different from those that inspired the lawmakers. So if you have the right kind of person recruited, and you don't have to be a lawyer, but certainly independent bars are accidentally, I'm sure, perfect as throwing up people with a willingness to express so-called dissent. And second, you must frame the role in a way that is designed to encourage the expression of opposite views. Now that requires real confidence in the polity. The people who vote for the parliament and the parliamentarians who vote for governments need at all levels to be confident that this is the kind of role they want. It's a pretty new role in the world. There aren't all that many of them. They haven't been around for a long time. But I think that there's a good future for such positions so long as they're given uh, security from government pressure, so long as they're given appropriate resources, uh, and so long as the task they perform is a focused one. Thank you. The second question. You begin your last report by observing about non-response, essentially by the government to your reports, or we could take it at a higher level, non-response to the very office of the uh, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. Now, moving on to the context of metadata and surveillance, emerging interpretations of Article 17 in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights require governments to justify. We can frame it as a form of dialogue, ongoing, in terms of surveillance and metadata. Yeah. So I take those two ideas and we merge them and we ask, will the government be able to enter into dialogue if it was, if it did have a response? I wonder what might that sound like? What is true dialogue and justification that you would be 
looking for in, um, in the perfect scenario? Uh, the best form that I'm aware of uh, is also the most practical and cheapest form, and that is routinely and frequently to have the monitor appear before parliamentary committees, either the committees of one or other of the houses or a joint committee. And most countries with parliaments or things like parliaments have devices whereby uh, subsets of the whole assembly can take on particular uh, subject matters and examine people who might be thought to have something useful to say. Uh, an official um, uh, person like uh, the monitor uh, is in my view um, an ideal person to be, as it were, hauled before the committee fairly frequently uh, and there to be examined, perhaps in a testing, even hostile fashion, uh, in relation to what he or she has done, hasn't done, has said, hasn't, uh, has said or hasn't said. Um, I really only had that once and it was not hostile at all. Um, uh, perhaps because I am an advocate in an adversarial system, I'm used to, uh, if not hostile, well certainly occasionally hostile, but certainly sceptical or testing dialogue between me and judges. And in my view, it enhances very considerably the standard of arguments and the standard of the ultimate resolution uh, after hearing argument for that to be so. It's very much like what we read about in terms of uh, the medieval testing of scholars. Mm -hmm. By final occasions, we still use uh, the expression viva voce to describe those kind of tests. Now, parliamentary committees are an obvious way to do it, but then so also are uh, public appearances. So uh, giving lectures in the civil, civil society segment uh, assisting academics uh, and scholars by lecturing from time to time. Um, specialist colleges, National Security College for example in Australia, um, they are all ways in which there can be something like dialogue. But you ask about dialogue and I think the best dialogue is that which is unstructured, that is not restricted, and which involves pushing and pressing people, perhaps on both sides. Um, I think that's all very practical and could be done. Uh, I regret that it wasn't done more. Thank you. Your role was a fundamental one. It was to create trust and integrity, essentially, in the context of counterterrorism laws. You were the first appointment. Now, in the context of metadata and surveillance, again drawing from international observations, a core feature is going to be independent oversight of some form in terms of metadata collection. I wonder, as you reflect back to your time in your role, what are the core features, skills, attitudes, characters, lessons learned to acquit the role of independent oversight? Um, there are two forms of independent oversight to be considered. The one is the very familiar form, many countries have it or an equivalent of it, and those are warrants, whether they're issued by judges, retired judges or other people sufficiently independent to make it worth getting their warrant. That can't be undersold as um, uh, existing essentially in order to bring the independence and also to bring the supervision or oversight which is uh, the safety check we have on these tremendous powers otherwise being given to, to the executive. Um, and all I can say in relation to that kind of independent oversight that I'm very enthusiastic about and have argued publicly ought to be required for access to quite a bit to do with metadata. Um, all I can say about that is you really must have an independent judiciary, a genuine, strong, independent judiciary. Not all countries have that. And so it's not easily generalised internationally. That's the first thing. I'd go so far as to say most countries do not have strong, independent judiciaries. So that's a real, real problem internationally. The second kind of independent oversight is the kind of specialised, focused position that I had as monitor and David Anderson had, had as monitor. 
um, committees of kinds in Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom now. Perhaps not quite the same. The, the chief lesson learned is that um, the very ample powers of investigation, uh, coupled with top secret clearance, is essential. Uh, I had it and I know that I could not have done the job uh, really at all, but certainly not to a degree that I would have regarded as appropriate without that. The capacity to be able to ask anybody, however senior and however delicate their secrets, questions that I thought germane to my uh, mandate was without any doubt um, at the heart of the matter. And Australia's legislation for the modernist position is very good, I think, in that regard. But the second thing is that you do really need to be given the wherewithal to push back as this independent uh, supervisor, to push back against the very strong combined force uh, of ministers, their advisers and the uh, bureaucracy. The ministers are actually the easiest, I think, because they understand rather more overtly the need for the independent role. I'm not so sanguine about the real acceptance of such roles among the what I call full-time professional bureaucracy. But that's all right so long as the monitor has the power and can wield it and is prepared to wield it. But the monitor literally has to sit somewhere as well as figuratively has to sit somewhere within a bureaucracy. And those are details, they sound trivial and housekeeping, but they are important details that need to be regarded. Literally, where is the monitor going to be? Um, I refuse to have in my professional chambers secret material because I didn't wish to add security um, risks. And so I travelled to an office that I had in Canberra. I'm content that it was sufficiently secure. But you need staff which I who I believe have to be dedicated only to that role. There must be no divided loyalties. It follows then that you won't be surprised to know that one of my last recommendations was that nobody should ever be able to be reappointed to such a position. I, I really do think that the uh, partial analogy with judicial tenure under the British system, the so-called act of settlement tenure, um, ought to be reproduced in such positions. Uh, you should have nothing to fear uh, while you uh, are of good behaviour during your term, but neither should you have anything to hope for. Now, I was perfectly happy to finish off doing this job, but I can well understand how some people uh, would be very anxious to continue. Um, I, I am not casting slurs on my colleagues when I say I think there is too much risk of subliminally wishing to impress, perhaps oblige, uh, those responsible for appointment uh, selections uh, if there is a possibility of reappointment. So all of that is a rather formal way of saying there must be real independence.